so thank you very much indeed again for the generosity, the time and effort done. And I'm really pleased to talk to you. Um, I have a very brief introductory note about you and then we can start with the questions. Uh, so uh, Professor Susan Nyman is an American moral philosopher, cultural commentator and essays. She has written extensively on the juncture between enlightenment, moral philosophy, metaphysics and politics, both for scholarly audiences and the general public. Professor Susan Nyman is director of the Einstein Forum. Her first book is Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, which uh, was published in 1992, if I'm not wrong. But she has authored other books, including um, Evil in Mother Thought, Modern Thought, sorry, Moral Clarity, a Guide uh, for Grown-Up Idealists, Why Grow Up, and Widerstand der Vernunft, and finally, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of the Evil, which is actually the focus of our conversation today. So again, thank you very much. And uh, um, so my first question, finally, is that I saw that this book has been translated into Persian, uh, I just wonder how do you think, uh, or how do you think such a book, which is about German and American history, basically, can relate to a, to an audience from Iran? Well, first of all, I've been pleased that several of my books have been um, translated into Farsi, and uh, I've never been there. So, you know, everything that I know about the country is very secondhand, but like many people around the world, I am following with uh, admiration and bated breath the um, courage of the people who are, um, you know, putting their lives on the line, literally, in the struggle for freedom, um, and honored if there's a way in which any of my work uh, can be useful to them. I have actually been told, and I was truly honored by um, somebody who was in a prison in Tehran for quite some time, that he read my book on evil when he was there, and that, you know, that was useful to him. I suppose one thing that this book might do is, well, let me, let me start again. Um, as I say in the book, I don't mean my conclusions to only be relevant to um, the United States and Germany. On the contrary, I originally, when I was writing this book, I thought I would not only take uh, the US and Germany as case studies. I also thought I, I wanted to talk about colonialism and I thought I would talk about Ireland, which is a country that I know fairly well. It was the first European colony and also the first colony to uh, rise up against colonialism as it did many times. So my original idea was to pre present three different countries and talk about the way examining one's history works both differently and similarly in all of them. There are plenty of other countries I could have taken, but since I'm really only good at two languages, um, I, you know, that that was going to be my focus. And I soon realized with my editor on my back saying the book was already too long that I really needed to confine myself to two. But there are re remarks in, um, you know, in the book that show that what I'm saying is applicable with important changes to many other countries. And the book, <laughs> to my great surprise, has, well, maybe not such a surprise that it's been translated into Hebrew and Dutch, but it's also been translated into Chinese, both in Taiwan and in the mainland. So um, clearly there's a universalistic message which is part of my deepest convictions that um, what it means to be on the left, and I see myself very much as a member of the left, is to not simply focus on tribal connections, but to show and have solidarity for people beyond your immediate tribe. And that it is for me perhaps a, the most basic principle of my own political thought and, and being. 
what's interesting, and this is where I'm just a little bit hesitant um, right now, is that I'm somewhat rethinking parts of the book, and I'm not sure how much it all needs to be rethought. So as my friend, the late historian Tony Judd used to say, quoting um, John Maynard Keynes, uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And the facts have changed in the last three years since I published that book, both in the United States and in Germany. But let me first say what the thesis, the original thesis is. The original thesis is that um, Germany, like no other country in the world, made its historic crimes a center of its historical narrative. Now, I still stand by that, okay? Um, countries like and people like heroic narratives. Everybody wants to put their country in the most heroic light as possible. And of course their ancestors. And when that becomes impossible because of great tragedies or losing wars, um, they see themselves as victims. You know, my ancestors would have been heroic, um, but history made them victims and, you know, some countries seesaw back and forth between a heroic and a victim narrative, but no country in the world ever said, you know what, um, we were perpetrators. We were fundamentally evil. Um, and that's something that we have to acknowledge and reckon with. Now, the Germans were very slow in acknowledging it. Um, they didn't want to, they still resist it in many ways. But at a certain point around the turn of the century, for a variety of reasons that I try to go into in the book, it really became a sort of the deepest conviction of um, you know, German self-understanding, German national narrative. And I began writing this book partly because I was so struck by the difference between that view of one's national history and what was going on in the United States, where basically, I mean, just for many years, um, as people probably know, if it happened in another country, if it happened in Germany, <laughs> the whole world would start pointing fingers and worrying about a resurgence of fascism. But, you know, the, the constant emphasis that the United States is the best country in the world, particularly by people who've never been anywhere else. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know much about any other country. Um, this is just an axiom that, you know, even people on the American left usually feel required to assert. And many um, Americans at least until very, very recently, didn't even know anything about America's national crimes. I believe that President Obama was the first you know, major political figure ever to mention that there might have been a problem in the way that we treated Iran in 1953, you know? I mean, this was this just covered up um, like all and you know, even he went to Hiroshima. I mean, this is a this is really important thing. Late in his second term, he became the first American president to visit Hiroshima. He did not apologize, but he was attacked viciously by Republican politicians for even going to Hiroshima, which obviously was a gesture of some kind of atonement. All right. So so um this is a major problem with American um, foreign affairs is, the, you know, inability to acknowledge how badly we uh, behaved in great parts of the world. Um, you know, um, 
basically the only foreign involvement that ever gets discussed in talking about American history um, is, uh, you know, the landing at Normandy, which inspires, you know, a, a new movie every other year or something, along with the completely false belief that we won the war at Normandy. Right. <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, it seemed to me that the U.S. in particular long seemed to me, I mean, for the time I first came to uh, West Berlin in 1982, mm -hmm. that America could take a lesson from what the Germans were even back then beginning to do regarding their own um, colonial adventures, mm -hmm. murderous colonial adventures. And then something, but so I've been thinking about this for a very long time. And then in 2015, when um, a white nationalist massacred nine churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina, um, President Obama gave a speech which left me like many other people in tears, I can remember um, standing watching it in my apartment in Berlin and thinking, wow, the United States is beginning a Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung because for the first time somebody had said, you know, and this was then not in re relation to foreign policy, but internal policy, we have to take down the Confederate flag, which is a symbol of white nationalism. We've never dealt with this. We need to start doing it. And I thought, well, okay, um, this is great. America's finally beginning to do something that it should have done long ago. And since I have been watching on the ground the way the Germans have dealt and not dealt with their own past, maybe I have something to offer. Okay, so that was how this book began. And I still think that... Um, the German example has something to offer in, in, you know, in this very broad historical sense. And there are lots of people who call themselves anti-Deutsche, um, you know, attack that, my view, you know, uh, with lines like, you know, no, Germany's never, uh, you know, done anything and look, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't worked through its colonial past. And I think this betrays an incredible amount of, of provinciality because, you know, what those people don't realize, of course, in countries like the United States, um, you know, you have monuments to mm -hmm. murdering racist Confederate soldiers all over the country, not only in the South, they're most prominent in the South, but they're all over the country. Um, and, you know, in ways that you simply wouldn't allow here. And then the line goes, you know, they, Germany has never dealt with its colonialism. And I want to say, um, has Spain, <laughs> has Portugal, has Britain, has France, you know, this is all Holland. Holland is beginning. Um, Britain is sort of beginning, you know, but all of the Spain, by the way, which was colonialism was probably the bloodiest in human history, um, resists even discussing it to this day, uh, much less its own fascist past. So, you know, Germany is beginning to look at its colonial past and try and answer for it. And I think that's a good thing, but I think it's because um, it, began by looking at its Nazi past and had a sort of practice in this process of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. Um, so I still basically think that's true. And I still think that every country um, has a tendency to bury some of its worst uh, episodes and, you know, like anything buried, this is a psychoanalytic claim, but, um, you know, you can also talk about dead bodies. Um, right. You know, mm -hmm. things begin to fester, wounds don't heal. And it's very particular 
to the country, which is why I don't want to say anything too directly about Iran, because I don't know enough about it. I was really surprised when my this publisher in Taiwan wanted to um, publish the book and said, well, it could help us in Taiwan. And I thought, wait, Taiwan, first of all, don't they have other problems right now? <laughs> and secondly, I've never been to Taiwan. So I, I had to do a little bit of reading about what they call the white terror, um, right. the you know early years of the country. But, uh, you know, again, so, so I think it's very important that there isn't, you know, a kind of cookie cutter, a standard package. This is how you reckon with your past folks. And, you know, there's one model for doing it. I think it needs to be done, but I also, I guess I'm moving towards the position that it needs to be done with more care than the Germans have done it recently. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's sort of like going, going to, uh, psychoanalysis, which can be extremely useful in some, uh, you know, in many, many cases, but you don't want to spend your life on the couch. You really don't. And there can be a way in which, you know, too much focus on trauma mm -hmm. can actually be quite counterproductive. So those are things right now that I, I mm -hmm. am open about, um, I mean, open in the sense that I'm, I feel like I'm still thinking them through in light of what's been happening in Germany in the past couple of years right. in which I've been an active participant. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I think, uh, thank you very much. That was very um, enlightening. I, I think actually the reason that it can be applicable or popular or understandable, uh, I mean, your books uh, in other places, other languages, is that there is a it's not purely historical. I mean, you're not historic. You're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're a philosopher. Yeah. So, um, and that's why there is this philosophical thread there that can actually address some of the questions. And actually, it also. Um, so, actually, my second question is also uh, relevant to that, which is like the. Um, so somehow, somehow, your your former books. Uh, the the main topic in your former works uh, was 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 the question of evil, and yeah. uh, I think that's a very philosophical question. And uh, you've written prolifically on that on the question of evil. So your question, I mean, you question even in this book. Um, I'm quoting you: Are we better at analyzing evil than goodness, or is goodness finally impossible to analyze? It is just something uh, simple. So that's my question: Is it? Wow. Yeah. That's a good um, question. No, actually, actually, I don't think it is. And my next book, I, you are right that I'm slightly obsessed with the uh, questions about evil. Although I try in my books, like to put in, <laughs> put in some time on the good between <laughs> different questions about evil. I mean, I wrote moral clarity after I wrote yeah. um, uh, evil in modern thought, for example, and that was quite deliberate. Um, and I am working on a book about heroism. Okay, so mm -hmm. so I don't actually think in the work that I've done on that book so far, I don't think good is unanalyzable. I think it's important to learn how to recognize it and to recognize acts of heroism. I got interested in the subject of heroism around the time after 9-11, when people were walking around saying, as if it were an obvious truth, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And the conclusion is, no, you can never say anything to decide whether, you know, one is the other. You have to, you have to just flip a coin. It all depends on what's now called your positionality. Um, and I have, been working on arguing, no, you can't give a recipe for goodness or heroism. I mean, I mean, let's distinguish between goodness and heroism. We hope most of us are inclined towards ordinary goodness, um, at least most of the time. Um, people who will take real risks in order to do something particularly good are in a separate category. 
Um, I don't think they have to risk their lives. They certainly don't have to lose it, but they have to risk something. They have to, you know, be willing to stand up against, you know, at the very least common opinion, their neighbors, their cultures, all that stuff. So I think it's very important to say, even if we can't give a recipe, we can analyze instances. We can decide this person was heroic. No, this person might look like a terror, a, a case of an American hero called John Brown. Um, this person has been called a terrorist, but actually he was a freedom fighter. And here are the reasons. And if you look carefully at the biography and you look carefully at the circumstances, you can actually make an argument. And you're right. I am. Um, I mean, I had very good training in philosophy, um, had a lot of quite amazing teachers in um, two different philosophical traditions, um, both in the U.S. and in Germany. Um, but I actually these days enjoy more reading history and literature because I, not that I've learned everything there is for philosophy to know, but I learned a lot. And I'm much more interested in giving some empirical content uh, to examples. Um, I think philosophy, and this is a controversial view among philosophers, but I think philosophy lives from good examples and it lives from learning how, how to analyze examples. So um, my next book will talk about analyzing goodness. I mean, it will analyze goodness. Wonderful. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in the book, uh, as we notice, I'm just quoting you, just as it's become axiomatic for decent Germans to insist that the Holocaust was the worst crime in human history, which should never be relativized by comparison with, uh, with, with anything, it's become axiomatic that this insight itself was far too slow in coming. Germans' Vergangenheit of Arbeitung was too late to, um, sorry, too little, too late, and above all, incomplete. So my question is, what made it too late and too slow? And even more important, what made it incomplete? Or what makes it incomplete? So look, um, certainly in West Germany, East Germany was a very different case, okay? East Germany was founded by real anti-fascists. And even if they instrumentalized their anti-fascism, as they did, because states instrumentalize their ideologies always, they were committed anti-fascists. And they were committed to getting as many old Nazis out of the government, out of the schools, out of, you know, um, influence in ways that West Germany was absolutely not. Um, you know, and this is this is fairly common knowledge, with the exception of, uh, you know, Adenauer himself, basically for the first 40 years of the Federal Republic, um, the teachers, the courts, the civil service, the police, um, you know, the diplomatic missions were all staffed by people who had been Nazis, some of them with great conviction, some of them simply to get ahead in their jobs. What's that? People know that. I mean, you, you don't have to know very much to know that piece of history. What people don't talk about and what it took me years um, to realize because <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to talk about it, understandably, is that for those 40 years, um, many Germans looked on themselves as the worst victims of the war. We lost the war. Our country was dismembered. All these people were killed. Our cities were shattered. And those damn Yankees and Brits wanted to blame us for starting the war. The only person who really said these things out loud, I mean, who's been remembered, who's, you know, sort of considered a major thinker, is Carl Schmidt. But it was an unbelievably uh, wide widely held attitude that, you know, there was this thing called uh, communicatives schweigen, which is an interesting term, you know. Um, everybody knew that, uh, you know, um, that's what they thought and that's what the silence was about. But nobody, of course, wanted to say it and certainly not to any foreigners or in a foreign language, you know. So 
but if they were press and you could you could see things and things like um Adorno and Horkheimer's Gruppen experiment um you know gives some passages where people say this where they were always relativizing German crimes. Well, look at Dresden. Well, look at the atomic holocaust of the Japanese. Well, war, as you know, terrible things happen in war all the time. Everybody does it. Um, people should stop pointing the finger at us. And it was a, it was a um, unbelievably, you know, it was a refusal to take any responsibility for having committed any crimes at all and seeing any attempt to do so as Ziga Justiz, Victor's justice. And it wasn't until Ernst Nolte really stated it out loud and began the Historica Streit that it sort of blew up in people's faces. And Nolte was... Um, Nolte said, well, actually, you know, the Bolsheviks made us do it. Um, you know, the crimes of the Nazis were copied from the, the Bolsheviks, and the only, the only thing that was different about them was industrialized gas chambers. But other than that, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't do anything except respond to the Bolsheviks. And that was a moment when Habermas and some other people, you know, came up with the idea that the Holocaust was singular. Now, the problem that I find with the whole discussion, and as a non-historian, I'm always surprised at how little history people remember. I mean, sometimes historians remember it, but it doesn't stay in the public memory. Um, Habermas was not making a metaphysical pronouncement, okay, about the Holocaust is absolutely singular and, you know, nothing in the world compares to it. Um, he wasn't even, you know, so much making a historical claim. It was a political intervention, and it was a very important political intervention because, you know, this was, the Historica Streit was very, um, it's sort of a year after Weizsäcker's famous speech, which was an obvious speech to anybody who didn't understand the pulse of West Germany. But it was the first time that you'd had a German president say, well, yeah, we all suffered a lot. And I know we suffered a lot. That was what I found so hard about it. The speech to understand, because if you go back and look at it, it mostly is about German suffering. But he's taking his audience with him and saying, we know we suffered. It was really awful. And so, But other people suffered more. And their suffering was our fault because we started the war. And again, for people outside Germany, this ought to be a Selbstverständlichkeit. But inside Germany, it was a big deal and it was much contested. So when Nolte, you know, I look at Nolte's intervention, you know, as definitely at least a partial response to uh, Weizsäcker's speech. Okay, and this sort of restoration, threatened restoration of. No, you know, maybe we should have, uh, you know, we weren't worse than anybody else and we don't need to take any special responsibility, you know, certainly not feel any particular guilt. So Habermas saying, no, the Holocaust was different. It was not a normal act of war. We need to take responsibility for it. Now, that was fine. It was a good thing. Okay. okay. The second thing that has always amazed me is that five years after the Historica Streit, four years after the Historica Streit, you have reunification. And suddenly everybody is talking about the Zwei Deutsche Diktaturen. Uh, um, that is, <laughs> you know, precisely the same thing that was supposed to be taboo four years earlier, that is comparing the Nazi crimes to anybody else's. They're not only being compared to Stalinism, which was what was at issue in the Historica Streit, they're being compared uh, to the DDR, which mm. as my teacher, um, Margarita von Brentano, philosopher uh, who hasn't been given enough credit for saying this, she said, no, no, you know, 
the Nazis left behind mountains of corpses. The the DDR mm -hmm. left behind mountains of Katai Kat. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. just, I find know. it interesting. Right. Yeah. 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 So um, so anyway, people, you know, were going around and have still were still up until a couple of years ago, annoying me, but. Uh, not many other people. I suppose it annoys Aussies, of course, but um, annoying me by going around talking about the two Deutsche Diktaturen and the Braune and the Rote Diktatur and so on and so on, as if they were entirely equivalent. And then all of a sudden, we get a different, um, we get a whole different kettle of fish, which goes back to the historical Streit, it gets called the historical Streit uh, 2.0. Right. And says, no, 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 we have to insist on the singularity of the Holocaust. And this, I, I mean, we can talk for a minute about where that comes. I think it's a complicated story where it comes from, but let me just say that I think it's deeply wrong. I understand it from a German perspective, although it's utterly ahistorical because it forgets the context of the Historikerstreit. Um, you know, it misreads that as a kind of metaphysical or sacred, um, you know, conclusion or or convergence mm -hmm. when it was a political. It was a political claim. It was an important political claim at the right. time. It is not, it is the wrong political claim to make at the moment because what it does is to set up the Holocaust, first of all, as the gold standard for evil against which anything else is just not all that bad. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's not good. Secondly, it elevates Jewish suffering as being worse than any other kind of suffering. Now, I know that there are people, among them, let's say, the Federal Commissioner for uh, Combating Anti-Semitism and many, many others. I know there are people who think somehow that this combats anti-Semitism to keep insisting on the singularity of the Holocaust. And I have been accused um, by many people of anti-Semitism because I don't think this is the way to go. Um, you might think it's odd for Germans to um, uh, accuse a very Jewish person. Um, I'm even, I mean, I have three citizenships. <laughs> I was <laughs> born in America. I uh, became a citizen of the state of Israel and I'm also a citizen of Germany. Um, but you know, the one thing that holds all those things together is that I am a Jew. Um, it's rather odd to be accused by Germans of anti-Semitism, but in denying the elevation of Jewish suffering, I strongly believe that this is the only way to go in fighting anti-Semitism. Because if Jews want other people to you know, feel solidarity in the struggle against anti-Semitism, which is very present. There's, I'm, nobody, right. no sane person would deny it. We need to show solidarity with the oppression, suffering, and murder of other peoples. And that's fairly basic. You cannot go around um, insisting on um, you know, your own pain being worse than uh, anybody else's and expect everybody else to support you. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work. Now, that's not quite what the Germans see themselves as doing. The Germans see themselves as, you know, responding at this point really to their grandparents rather than their parents and saying, no, no, we take responsibility. We're not trying to palm off responsibility like our grandparents did when they pointed to the bombing of Dresden, okay? Mm -hmm. We're saying, no, there's a difference between rounding up people from all over Europe, uh, you know, or invading the Soviet Union and massacring millions um, and retaliation. I mean, whatever you 
not to defend the bombing of civilians in Dresden, but there's a huge difference between those two cases, okay? Um, so I understand why Germans want to insist on the singularity. Mm. I simply think it's a huge mistake and it's very different. So for a Jew to say it wasn't singular is to say, no, I want to take responsibility for uh, not just for crimes against my own tribe, but for crimes against others. Mm -hmm. And I, somehow I haven't succeeded in convincing Germans of this difference, but I intend to keep trying. Who knows? Maybe I've convinced a few. Right. Uh, I should say, uh, and this is a comment that will definitely get me um, called anti-Semitic, although it wouldn't in Israel, where um, mm. many people on the left know and say this, mm. um, the Israeli government deliberately wants to insist on the singular suffering of the Jews in order to justify Palestine policies against Palestinians, which violate human rights. Right. And, you know, Israel works very hard to con try and convince other countries to do the same thing. And uh, right. it's, mm. it's uh, very hard to speak out about this. Sure, sure, it is. Because one really worries about trafficking in anti-Semitic or enforcing anti-Semitic stereotypes, which are very real. But, uh, you know, particularly with um, not only the most right-wing government in Israel's history, but one of the more right-wing governments in the world now in the state of Israel, um, I and... Um, most of my Jewish friends feel that it's imperative to speak out. Right. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I mean, uh, um, there is, again, I, I just try to relate this whole project and um, and see, I actually, it's, um, uh, see, you see this book against the backdrop of your other books, especially uh, Clarity and, uh, and, and the project on moral clarity. I mean, and my question is that um, how can we uh, reconcile clarity or moral clarity with invisible forms of evil? I have a quote from you where you say, we have learned to be wary of invisible evil, the kind that can belong to structures in which decent people play a, play a part. The evil that Bush rightly called the invisible, uh, called visible, seemed an anachronistic throwback that we did not know how to name. Uh, this paralyzed some of the left's reaction to 9-11. Most of Bush critics have been so appalled by the instrumentalization of the terrorist attacks. Richard Rorty compared it to the Nazis' use of the Reichstag fire, that we are loath to do anything that seemed to feed it. Uh, so, I mean, um, in, in some parts of the book, you talk about these, um, these sort of um, invisible forms of evil. And then I tried to, I, mean, I, I was sort of like curious or challenged to see how we can reconcile this with moral clarity, with clarity that you're appreciating in other projects. Well, that's a great question, particularly in response to what I was just saying about Israel-Palestine. Mm. Um, because I hadn't been thinking about the, you know, 9-11, the complexity of 9-11. It's, you know, it's 21 years away and other uh, shit has hit the fan since. Um, but it's relevant to both. And I, I guess I think um, at least what I try to do is show that clarity is not the same thing as simplicity. And uh, in fact, it's rarely the same thing as simplicity. And that one needs to work with concrete historical examples. Again, not recipes, not algorithms, concrete historical examples 
you know, to be able, for example, to recognize two different forms of evil, all right? On the one hand, um, you know, as I was saying before, anti-Semitism is a real evil and it hasn't gone away. On the other hand, instrumentalizing, um, you know, the fear of anti-Semitism to violate human rights in the occupied territories is also evil. I mean, you know, there's a way in which um, it's, uh, you know, it's almost worse because it's, it's using people's moral emotions in order to do something that's actually profoundly immoral. And the same thing happened with 9-11. I mean, Bush and his uh, regime took over this deep international shock and revulsion um, on this, as everybody remembers, even if they weren't there, you know, beautiful clear day in September suddenly, um, you know, out of nowhere, uh, passenger planes are turned into instruments of death to knock out um, what were, I forget what exactly the totals were. It went back and forth um, several times with thousands of people. Um, and it was quite interesting. I was in Berlin at the time and it was quite interesting to feel the international shock and horror at that massive, very visible form of terrorism. But for George W. Bush to turn that into what he called the shock and awe campaign um, to invade Iraq, um, you know, based on incredibly, you know, a dubious chain of events, a chain of reasoning that uh, you know, somehow this would avenge 9-11 or make another 9-11 impossible. That's, that was a, another form of evil. And it was interesting. I can remember Hillary Clinton saying when she later campaigned for president, well, if I knew then what I knew now, I would uh, I would never have voted to authorize the invasion of Iraq. And I thought, lady, <laughs> I've never had a security clearance and I never will. I had no access to any privileged information. I did talk to Hans Blix, who I who was the person who was supposedly, um, you know, sent to be a neutral observer of weapons of mass, alleged weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I invited him to the Einstein Forum at the time. But I, what made me certain that the excuses for going to war were false is that they kept coming up with new ones, you know? Like if you really have, you know, war is a terrible thing. If you have an ironclad reason for doing it, you better have one ironclad, you know, you better show what it is and not keep coming up with, well, we want to do this or that. Well, well, maybe then we just obvious that, um, that they were lying and, you know, playing on, you know, this, the genuine shock and awe that people had had, um, at 9-11 to, uh, you know, kill hundreds of thousands of people and, you know, set up a course of events that I don't know the, the Middle East can recover from. It certainly hasn't recovered from it yet, you know? So, I mean, that's the kind of analysis that people have to learn to do. And I, I hope that what I've done in my books is to show that actually you can get quite clear if you work at it. Um, you just have to forget the idea that there are formulas for deciding if something is good or something is evil. And you have to look very carefully at particular cases. So, yeah. you know, I, people would love to have rules. People hate what I, you know, <laughs> they hate being told 
general things like, um, you know, look very carefully at particular cases. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's the only way that you can make judgments yeah. of anything, and certainly moral judgments. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very interesting that you, as you told um, in the beginning, that your next project or the, the, the book that's going to be released uh, soon is uh, uh, on heroism and victims and so on and so forth. So my, my... The next but one. The next book is called Left is Not Woke. Um, okay, so... Some of these, these issues, but not as explicitly. And the one after that, which won't come until 2014, Four, all right uh, is about heroes and victims yeah so okay right so that, that my, my question was that i mean um competitiveness and victimhood to take just one significant example that you highlight in the book the current value placed on being a victim and the glorification of victims as heroes it should be seen as a denial of a human of human freedom and dignity a denial of happiness and a barrier against hope there is an Olympics, as you say, of suffering going on. I like this code, even in, in one interview, you say that. Um, 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 a market of competition or a competition of victimhood. So beyond seeing it as a moral wrong, what you said reminded me of the book that I recently read. It's called Elite Capture, a book yep. by, yeah, by Olufemi Taivu which deals with the confused ways the concept of identity is used in political culture. The idea of aided capture, capture has been around for decades and typically describes how the most advantaged people in a group take control of benefits that are meant for everybody, as, for example, how a leader in a developing country might use foreign aid money to, to line his own pockets. Can we relate this market of victimhood or to, to competitiveness inherent in, in, in capitalism? Absolutely, and I, and I quote uh, Taiwo's book in, um, in my new book, Left wow, is Not okay. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's good. I, I don't think it goes quite far enough. And actually your question about capitalism is one that had not occurred to me, but I like it a lot. Um, you know, except that it isn't just capitalism. What, you know, if you, if you look at how people used to regard themselves, everybody wanted to be a better hero than the next person, you know, and it, it wasn't that you were denying other people's, you know, heroic action, but that was the standard. Okay. You, you know, by which you measured yourself. Where, whether you were measuring yourself, you know, whatever field it was, um, you know, it needn't be, hopefully wasn't militarily, although sometimes it was military. It's all kinds of other, um, all kinds of other, um, you know, fields of human endeavor, right? And what's interesting about that. So that was even before capitalism. I mean, all you have to do is read the Iliad. Um, you know, um, people are trying to be, you know, who's more heroic than than the next guy. Um, but what's appealing about that way of looking in the world is at least you want to be judged by something you do. Okay. Um, whether it's being the strongest or the smartest or the kindest or the one who's willing to sacrifice something for somebody else's happiness or health, you know. Um, and a competitive victimhood is not about what you do. It's about what you suffer, which is quite perverse if you think about it. Um, and it's a real problem. I'm glad that Taiwo and some other people are, you know, beginning to talk about it because it's, um, uh, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. There was just a, a friend of mine who teaches at the New School in New York, the very famous university that was a, a haven for so many Germans who um, had to flee German German intellectuals who had to flee uh, 
the Third Reich, including most famously Hannah Arendt, but a whole bunch of others. The New School has always had this incredibly progressive reputation as you know, being that's that's where you look for um, an entire university that's sort of devoted to broadly anti-fascist politics, whatever they are. So recently they appointed the entire university administration, all of the people who are running the place. They're all black and some of them are queer. Decent working conditions went on strike with them. They shut down the university for weeks. And what happens? The administration attacks the strikers for damaging the new school. <laughs> Capitalist language, progressive yeah, brand, right. and and called people racist. Like, how could mm. they, um, uh, you know, uh, with a black gay president, mm. possibly um, be not progressive? And this is exactly an example of what Taiwo was talking about in uh, the capture. But he read the book right. before the New School right. Strike. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so, so uh, great, yeah, wonderful answer. Um, so, if if you allow, my my next question is about um, is about irony. Uh, the and, and so um, um, I, I actually I start with a with a quote from from a philosopher Lydia Amir, uh, who has written a lot on on humor and irony. Um, I don't know if you know her. I mean, I, I actually I used her, her books a lot in my PhD dissertation. She has written a lot on good life and humor. I mean, not not on irony necessarily, but on humor actually. So, so my, my my question is, I mean, I start with a quote from her. Lydia Amir writes that the philosopher realizes that a subject to be laughed at is none other than himself. This becomes the reason for his laughter. <coughs> Contrary, <coughs> sorry. Contrary to the laughter of unphilosophical natures, which is directed, directed at others. Philosophical reflection requires self-distancing, which divides the philosopher's consciousness into laughing and the laughable, the laughter and the but, end of quote. So later Amir adds that this can also help us reach the pain, painful discrepancies which underscores to, 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 uh, to your aim of what is and what ought to, which reminded me of Schopenhauer and his interest in, in humor and the question of is and ought to. So uh, to make it short, um, um, I, I, I sort of think that irony can play a role in growing up because also growing up is, and is a is a very vital part of your project. Um, uh, although I think that, um, um, I mean, a person who is, um, I know, I, I know that there might be some. That's very sensitive because irony can cause some sense of some sort of immorality and some sort of unseriousness. But I would, I, 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 li I like to know your idea. I mean, you, you, you take some distance from irony in your project. You're somehow, sometimes you are associating it with some kind of cynicism or hopelessness, if I'm not wrong. Um, but I think it is also something that is missing in Germany or in the German um, working after past. Because I mean, through irony, you can be reminded of your present. Very good, very good question. So look, I'm sorry you think that I'm somehow opposed to irony because I think there's no, no. A, I think there's a lot of irony in in my uh, books. Um, even in evil and modern thought, there's quite a bit of irony. Um, look, there are some people who I deeply admire. I mean, two germ two. German philosophers whom I deeply admire. One is Hannah Arendt, who, by the way, in her lifetime was not considered a philosopher. She didn't call herself. She once said she wasn't a philosopher. I think she's wrong about that. Now she is considered a philosopher. The other people who person who has influenced my writing style a lot, um, who practically no one but me ever considers a philosopher, but I do, is Jean Amari. And both Amari and are, have this in common. They're masters of irony. 
but they're also able to express outrage and passion. And if you can do both of those, which Nietzsche is probably the only philosopher, German, German philosopher, both of them were Jewish. Um, Nietzsche is probably, the, and he learned a lot from Heine. I mean, Heine can also do it. Um, you know, Nietzsche was probably the last real German philosopher I can think of that really worked with irony. But if you can't also express outrage and passion, then it does become cynical. I mean, there's certain, there's a kind of, I suppose, ironic ethos that belongs to certain postmodern philosophers that suggests that, you know, since there are no absolute rules of either, you know, knowledge or morality, nothing really matters and you can just sort of be ironic. Um, if that's your only stance towards the world, I think it's a problem. But if you're able to incorporate other stances into the world, um, I think it's important. Now, regarding the German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, that is a, uh, that's a huge, um, that's, that's a really good point. It's entirely missing in irony. And you can't talk about Jews without talking about irony. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I don't want to. the whole Jewish humor thing. I mean, my totally, God. Totally. I, I mean, I don't want to claim we invented it, but, um, but we are masters of it. And so there was recently a case, for example, which, um, which came up in November. Um, two Jewish students went to see a play in Munich by a Lebanese playwright called Vaji Muad. Um, and uh, they decided it was anti-Semitic and they wrote a letter uh, insisting that it be taken off stage and that the city of Munich withdraw its funds from the theater. Okay. And when I first read about this, first of all, I was appalled because this is, this, you know, one sees a lot of um, cancellation. Second thing that happened to, to me was that I saw in the first newspaper notice, it was written by Moad in close cooperation with the great uh, historian, Natalie Zeman Davis, who happens to be Jewish. And um, I work together with a group of left-wing Jewish activists who are trying to be a conscience of uh, as somebody suggested today we we should vote ourselves as representing the last democratic uh embassy, embassy of israel <laughs> it's, there isn't one anymore and uh so one of my friends wrote um shouldn't we see the script before we get involved in this case and I said, I don't need to see the script. If Natalie Seaman Davis was involved in it, it's not anti-Semitic. So I, um, but I did see the script. And of course, it's not anti-Semitic at all. What the students were objecting to largely was some humor that's very Jewish. Um, and um, I, I mean, the play is so non-anti-Semitic that one has to ask oneself, and this is, uh, you know, a project that we're thinking of engaging with, um, you know, whether or not we could run through the movies of Woody Allen, the books of Philip Roth, you know, and point out the so-called anti-Semitism in them by this criterion. Um, you know, actually, I can think of passages in Heinrich Heine that would be deeply anti-Semitic, right? Um, so the Germans, including the you know people who now represent the official Jewish policy, the Zentralrat der Juden in Deutschland, is taken to be representative of all Jews in Germany likes to think of itself as representative of all Jews in Germany. Um, in fact, they only represent less than half of us. And it's one of the most conservative Jewish organizations in the world. Um, so, um, you know, but that 
brand of Judaism or those representatives of Judaism, it's not a brand of Judaism, um, have entirely lost the capacity for irony. And of course, um, they pass on that attitude towards the Germans who, you know, on the one hand, I've always wondered, I mean, I have seen Woody Allen in, in a German theater and seen people laughing, but also wondered if they got the jokes because I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the I think one reason for that is that, I mean, uh, sometimes in a sense, um, reminding me of the Thales, the, the, the Greek philosopher, like uh, being so deep and falling in the well. I mean, being that precise about something so unambiguously and so precisely and meticulously analyzing and delving in the street might blind you to what is actually in front of you, uh, what you are, you know, the other atrocities that you are actually committing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have this, I have this, um, a little, I have two questions left, sorry, sorry Susan. I mean, um, uh, one of them is like, um, is comprised of two quotes. One of them is from um, um, from a book that I really uh, enjoyed recently reading that. It's called uh, Between the World and Me. Um, so Tanahasi quotes um, uh, the book I have here. here even well, I know the book. book. Of course I know the book, yeah. Right, yeah. I have some problems uh, with it, but I know the book, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book. Um, so, I mean, I have a quote from that which is related, I, I sort of can relate it to, to another quote that I had um, um, from Levinas, I think. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the relation was interesting for me. I don't know if it's also um, um, uh, sensible. To you, so the quote is from the book uh, between the world and me is that um, there must uh, this must seem strange to you, my son. I mean, the author is talking to his son. This might uh, this must seem strange to you. We live in a goal oriented era. Our media vocabulary is full of hot takes, big ideas, and grand theories of everything. But some time ago, I rejected magic in all its forms. This rejection was a gift from your grandparents who never tried to console me with ideas of an afterlife and were skeptical of preordained American glory. In accepting both the chaos of history and the fact of my total end, I was freed to truly consider how I wished to live, especially how do I live free in this black body? It's a profound question because America understands itself as God's handwork, handwork, handiwork, but the black body is the clearest evidence that America is the work of men. I have asked the question through my reading and writing, although, I'm um, sorry, through the music of my youth, through arguments with your grandfather, with your mother, with Aunt Janai, your Uncle Ben. I have searched for answers in nationalist myth in, in the classroom, out on the streets, and on the continents. The question is unanswerable, which is not to say futile. The greatest reward of this constant interrogation of confrontation with the brutality of my country is that it has freed me from ghosts and girded me against the sheer terror of this embodiment. So end of quote, sorry, that was a bit long. I sort of compared that, this, this fact that, um, you cannot actually purely get rid of fascism, broadly speaking. It reminds me of the other quote from Levinas talking about violence. I'm, I'm quoting him. We must stop thinking that we can get rid of violence once and for all. To desire to get rid of violence once and for all implies wanting to get rid of potential, potentiality once and for all for all, end of quote. I mean, it sort of relates to the book. It sort of relates to the fact that um, Vergangenheit of Arbeit is not, it cannot be terminated, it cannot be finalized. It is something ongoing, always. So look, I agree with that entirely on the one hand, um, which is one of the things that that annoys me about the 
the anti-Deutsche who keeps saying, oh, there's been no Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, mm -hmm. you know, and I want to say, um, I'm sorry, I came to this country in 1982. And I remember what it was like, um, not just to be a Jew, but to be any form of what were then called Ausländer, we no mm -hmm. longer use the word. Mm -hmm. um, it was another experience entirely than what we have now, which is not to say that we should rest content with what we have now, um, but that we should appreciate, uh, you, you know, it's a, just a deep view of mine. You will never make more progress in the world if you don't appreciate the progress that's been made. And one of the things, by the way, about Coates, he doesn't say, I mean, Coates is a terrific writer. There's no question about it. Um, I've read, I think, all of his work that exists. And as he's gone on, I'm not crazy about the direction that he's um, gone in. I I think Afro-pessimism, which he is inclined to, which is just the view that um, the suffering of Black people is, um, you know, unending and worse than the suffering that's been visited on other people. Sorry, but that's just for me, the, the other side of the singularity of the view that the Jews have suffered more than any other people in the world and that anti-Semitism is eradicable. Now, um, I think that it's probably pointless to think that we will never, you know, that we will someday stop being entirely afraid of or suspicious of the other, okay? Um, you know, that I think is true. Um, but again, if you look at the progress that has been made, I mean, in both of those countries, gosh, I, you know, I mean, I, I grew up at a time where I could not swim in the same lake as a Black child, okay? Very deep, memory of my early childhood in the South, okay? So to say that nothing has changed, which um, Coates and uh, sometimes inclined to the view, he doesn't quite say that, but he's he moves towards that view. And Frank Wilderson, who he reads a lot, and Sadia Hartman, some, sometimes inclined towards that view. That strikes me as, um, First of all, it's blind to history. And secondly, it leads to a kind of resignation. I mean, if you think that nothing has ever changed through enlightenment and political activism, why bother to try and change anything else? Um, the other thing that my, my new book attacks um, is exactly the, the absence of a deep, uh, concept of progress in on the contemporary left, um, but that's that's uh, something to talk about in a couple of months when the books when the book comes out. Um, so, it, you know, I think this may sound too commonsensical to be interesting, but sometimes common sense is right. I think that we have to acknowledge that we've made progress in so many ways in my own lifetime. Mm -hmm. Progress, this does not mean that progress is necessary, my God. We also regress in certain ways. But, you know, we've seen genuine movements against racism, against sexism, against homophobia. You know, that has made a difference for millions of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And to deny that is to dishonor some of the many people who fought to make that progress, some of them at the cost of their lives. So um, I, I, get, I get rather angry when, when people you know, want to deny uh, that we make some progress against it. But I also think it's an ongoing uh, project to, you know, become better, more thoughtful, kinder, more humane, um, you know, freer, all of those, all of those things are, are matters for people to work on in their own lives and for generations of people to work on. On the other hand, I'll go back to what I said at, uh, at the beginning about, um, you know, I'm, 
a believer in, in psychotherapy in all kinds of situations, but one does know people for whom psychotherapy became a narcissistic trap. Mm. And to continue um, to focus on one's own trauma can be, uh, you know, first of all, narcissistic and, and secondly, unhealthy. And I sometimes think that a lot of German feminists, Alpha Beitung, is an unhealthy focus on the Germans' own trauma mm -hmm. at the expense of, you know, looking at what's going on in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I think, by the way, this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, Germany was slow to recognize uh, what was going on in Putin's Russia, because mm -hmm. they, I mean, obviously there are people who just simply wanted to make money off of doing business, but there were people, and I count uh, our Bundespräsident as one of them, who were sincerely mm. concerned with the ways in which uh, the, you know, the Wehrmacht had murdered, well, it wasn't the Wehrmacht who murdered 6 million Jews or most of them, but, you know, the Nazis had murdered not only 6 million Jews, but 14 million mm. Soviet civilians. And, you know, felt compelled to see the Russians as German victims mm -hmm. rather than to look at what was going on in Russia. Unfortunately, I think the same thing is going on right now with Israel-Palestine. Um, I had um, I had this, um, I mean, just talking about like Germans and the way they talk about, um, they react to to the politics in in Russia, I mean Putin and uh, the recent war, and you had some parts in the book that you're talking about Bettina Stagner. Uh, I I didn't know her, and uh, um, she's great, yeah. And I think she's among those who try to relate that to the contemporary issues, be it Putin or being Trump, right? She's just told me she's coming out with a new book on that subject very soon. I look forward to reading it. Yeah. She has an even harsher view. Uh, she has, some, I mean, we talked briefly. She, um, I interviewed her in the book because, uh, first of all, because I think she's an immensely intelligent, I mean, just I think she's one of the most interesting philosophers in Germany. Um, not recognized as such, but um, she is. And, um, but I know that she's thought a great deal about the German past. Her book, uh, Eichmann Before Jerusalem, is mm -hmm. a classic. Um, mm -hmm. Although, weirdly, it hasn't been read as much in Germany by the people who uh, should read it or who mm -hmm. I expect to read it. But, um, you know, she kept pushing back on my my comparative view of of Germany, um, of German Vergangenheit, where I would say, yeah, I I know. I'm not saying that they, first of all, I know they took a long time and didn't want to do it. Secondly, I know they didn't do it perfectly or in many cases even well, but look at what it's going, mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. in the other part of the world, look comparatively. And she's very strong at saying, I don't care about comparisons. Um, I think I even quote her as saying a nice metaphor, something if my soup is too salty, I don't, right, uh, yeah, yeah, I I don't, don't care yeah. if the neighbor's soup is worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I can see that point of view. I think it's a function of the fact that I have lived and worked in three different countries um, that as far as in my power, I'm always trying to see things mm -hmm. in some kind of comparative mm -hmm. view. Uh, wonderful, Suzanne. Thank you very much indeed. That was, that was really a great opportunity for me.